Well, I'm going to come right out and say it. I'm a real fan of this problem. I like it for a couple of reasons. One, it asks us to perform a number of operations involving functions when we're not actually told what the function is. Namely, we're just given the value of the function at selected points. That's often puzzling for students, but it, I think, deepens our understanding of the concepts involved. And second, I really like the way this problem mixes up a number of concepts so that it requires us to understand how one concept and another relate. As you can see, there are several concepts that are covered in this problem set. So let's just um, jump into part A, where we are asked to find the slope of the tangent line. Okay. And in general, the equation of a tangent line is something that I think we all know. We use point-slope form, where the slope is the uh, derivative of the function in question at that particular point. Okay. So let's start there. And I'm just going to say that in general, the equation of a tangent line is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, where m itself is uh, the derivative of the function evaluated at that very point x1, y1. So let's think through what that means for us in this case. First of all, x equals 3, x1 equals 3. And therefore, y1 must equal the function evaluated at x equals 3. So that's k of 3, which in turn is f of g of 3. OK, so how do we do that evaluation? Well, uh, again, we work from the inside out. What is g of 3? Uh, g evaluated at an input of 3 is 6. And that means that we now need to find what f of 6 is. So we look up f of 6, and that we find is 4. And so the answer here is 4. That's our y1 value. Now what about the m value? Well, m is uh, k prime evaluated at 3. But for that, we'll have to use the chain rule. Now, a key fact about the chain rule that comes into play here is that we first take the derivative of the so-called outer function, but we take it with respect to the inner function. And that means that we're evaluating it at the value where the inner function is it in turn has to be evaluated at x equals in this case 3 and so what that all that means is we have g of 3 equals 6 and so what we're really evaluating is f prime of 6 times g prime of 3 and that's going to give us f prime of 6 that's going to be 5. g prime of 3, that's going to be 2. Again, it's a very common mistake to think that we need to find f prime of 3. But if you look back at this notation, it tells you that you have to evaluate g of 3. And g of 3 gives 6, so we're finding f prime of 6. Our value, of course, then is 10. So putting it all together, we have okay, y minus 4 equals 10 times x minus 3. Now just one more note, and that is I'm going to leave this in point-slope form. There is no need to rewrite this in y equals mx plus b form. It's not a requirement for the question, and 
doing so is going to use up time that uh, could be better spent on the rest of the problem since you are under a time constraint and it also might introduce mistakes. So there's simply no need to do anything but leave it in point slope form. Let's go on to part B. Part B is actually reasonably straightforward. Uh, we're trying to find h prime of 1, and given that h is defined as a ratio of two functions, we'll need to use the quotient rule. The only twist, and I've done this on purpose, is I've written the quotient rule in a way that's traditional for, m for many textbooks, namely f of x over g of x. Notice, of course, that probably deliberately here on the AP exam, they have reversed the traditional order and defined uh, g of x as the function that is in the numerator and f of x as the one in the denominator. So again, it simply emphasizes the fact that when we have the various formulas that we're applying in calculus, uh, they are patterns that have to be matched. The functions aren't literally always defined as f and g. So at any rate, we can uh, plug right in here and just say that uh, h prime of 1 equals the function in the denominator, which in this case is f evaluated at that place, times uh, the derivative of the function in the numerator minus uh, the function in the numerator times the derivative of the function in the denominator. All of that, of course, divided by the value of the function in the denominator, that quantity squared. Uh, so it's really left to us to simply plug in the appropriate quantities. What do we have here? f of 1 is negative 6. g prime of 1 is 8. g of 1 is 2. f prime of 1 is 3. f of 1 again is negative 6. Putting that together, we're going to get that h prime of 1 equals a negative 48 minus 6 all over 36, which simplifies to negative 3 over 2. Now, a couple of points. Remember, for non-calculator questions, you are not under an obligation to simplify. You can simply take this process right to this point, the negative 48 minus 6 over 36, and call it a day and receive full credit. And again, I suggest that's a good use of your time um, because you can save the time you would have spent simplifying and the possibility of making a mistake you can save that time for uh, the rest of this problem or other problems. I think that for many students, Part C is a pretty challenging problem. There's a lot going on, and so I'd just like to walk you through, maybe a little more slowly than normal, the key decisions and insights that are required to navigate this problem. Let's just put a line here to divide up the areas. And let's, let's go ahead and start with this initial expression. So we have this integral from 1 to 3 of f double prime of 2x dx. Now, before we really get started on the particulars, it's probably worth noting that we are explicitly told that uh, at the beginning of the problem that f and g have continuous second derivatives. Now, why is that? Well, in this case, it's because 
it assures us that this expression can in fact be evaluated and have a finite answer. The fact that f double prime, which is the integrand here, is continuous over a finite interval, namely from one to three, tells us that this expression can be evaluated and give us a finite result. I don't think that that's really necessary for you to mention in your response but for those that really want to understand, uh, it's just a little bit of, uh, maybe you'd call it trivia or a little extra for experts insight. So what to do with this fairly complicated looking expression? Well, my hope is that seeing the 2x will trigger in your mind the notion of u substitution. Why is that? Well, because we need to convert this expression into something that can be looked up in the table to the left, since we know nothing else about the function f. And so u substitution can get us partly there. So what would be the appropriate choice for u? Well, hopefully you'll understand, having done a lot of these problems, that u equals 2x is uh, the appropriate at least initial choice to see if it helps. So if u equals 2x following the procedure for uh, u substitution, we now cr calculate du dx, which in this case equals 2, and that allows us to rewrite x as du over 2. Okay? It's just a little calculation off to the side. Now we can substitute in for what we're given. We can rewrite this as an integral of f double prime of u. And then we'll substitute in for dx as du over 2. Now, what about the limits of integration? Well, again, because we're working with u and the original limits of integration that were given were for x, we have to adjust those limits. Namely, when x is 1, u is 2. When x is 3, u is 6. And so formally, we have to write it like this. OK. Well, there's progress there. I'm just going to rewrite this as I'm going to bring the 1 half out front. OK, what next? We don't have any information about f double prime of, a, func of a, a value in the table. And so somehow, this expression has to be changed so that it relates to our table. Well, at this point, I hope the fact that you know something about f prime but know nothing about f double prime will trigger in your mind that maybe the fundamental theorem can be applied. Because the fundamental theorem of calculus is always about connecting a function with its derivative. So what can we say about this expression? Well, let's look at this statement down here of the fundamental theorem. This part here looks quite a bit like the part that we've called attention to here. A is 2, B is 6, U can be substituted for X, and yet what we have here is the derivative of a function. Here we have the second derivative of a function. So the insight is this. The second derivative of F is also the first derivative of another function, namely F prime. And so we can match the pattern to say that f prime of b equals f prime of a plus the integral from a to b of f double prime of x dx. So now we can write the integral from 2 to 6 f double prime of u du can be written as 
f prime of 6 minus f prime of 2. I'm just going to add this by an application. of the fundamental theorem. Okay. So f prime of 6, what is that? Well, we have that in the table at last. So f prime of 6 we know is equal to 5. f prime of 2 we have negative 2. And so 5 minus negative 2 is 7. And so we have a final result. I'm just going to say putting all this together. from 1 to 3 of f double prime of 2x dx equals 7. This is the result we got here, 5 minus negative 2. But let's not forget the factor of a half that we had. Again, uh, as I said before, I think uh, part C is fairly challenging for many students. It's worth your time to step yourself through each of the arguments that we've made here and ideally explain them to someone else. Uh, might not 